It is. Great, thank you, Victoria. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Angel and I am a board member of the Dallas Mexican American Historical League. Today's event is part of the Nuestra Oak Cliff exhibit during the Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month and will focus on the Mexican American life in Oak Cliff. We hope that those who live, currently live, have lived or have a connection to Oak Cliff are able to enjoy the exhibit and the free programming. Tonight, I have the honor to be joined by three phenomenal members of our Dallas community, Giovanni Valderas, Yolanda Alameda, and Juan Contreras. Before we kick off tonight's conversation on community involvement, we wanted to share with you several upcoming events including the historical photo exhibit at the Latino Cultural Center from September 22nd, as in tomorrow, until October 16th. And tomorrow is also Cara Mia's opening night of the Latinidades at the Latino Cultural Center. And there will be an outdoor theater performance and a lot more. The Jesse Tafaya speaker series, including today's virtual community involvement panel in English, and we will, have been, we will be having another one on Thursday in Spanish that will feature Mary Lou Paras, Raul Reyes, and Violeta Gallardo Montejano. And we will also be hosting an in-person interview with Dallas ISD Superintendent Michael Hinojosa. And last but not least, we're excited to also share that we will premi premiere the Nuestra Oak Cliff documentary. For all in-person events, masks are required. The story of Oak Cliff is not complete without the story of Mexican Americans in Oak Cliff from as early as 1930s to the present day. This history is an important one, so please share widely with your friends and family and ask them to share as well. During tonight's presentation, we will be monitoring the chat during the Q&A portion, so please place your questions in the comments that you might have for any of the panelists. We would also like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors. Thank you to Methodist Dallas Medical Center, Bank of America, Vecinos Unidos, Dallas Truth Racial Healing and Transformation, the Latino Cultural Center, and the City of Dallas Office of Arts and Culture. These efforts have also been supported by funding from the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, made possible by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. Now, a message from one of our sponsors. In order to stop the spread of COVID-19, Methodist Dallas Medical Center is hosting a vaccination clinic that is open Mondays and Fridays from 6.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. To schedule an appointment, you can visit this website on the screen or take a photo of the QR code. I will hold for a few seconds for those wanting to take a photo of the screen. Ahora, un mensaje de uno de nuestros patrocinadores para detener la propagación del COVID-19, Methodist Dallas Medical Center está organizando una clínica de vacunación que está abierta los lunes y viernes de seis y media de la mañana hasta las cuatro y media de la tarde. Para registrarse para una cita, puede visitar este sitio web que ve en la pantalla o puede tomar una foto del código QR que ve en la pantalla. Mantendré durante unos segundos esta pantalla aquí para aquellos que quieran tomar una foto de la pantalla. As I shared earlier, we are joined today with three wonderful guests that I will now go ahead and introduce. A native of Dallas, Giovanni Valderas is an assistant professor of art at Texas Women's University in Denton. Previously, he was the exhibition manager at the Fort Worth Community Arts Center and assistant gallery director at Kirk Hopper Fine Art. He began his career as the gallery director at Mountain View College. In addition, Valdera served as an appointee by Dallas City Council as a vice chair of the Cultural Affairs Commission. Valderas graduated from the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas with a Master's of Fine Arts in Drawing and Painting. He has taught painting and drawing courses at the University of North Texas, Richland, and Mountain View College. 
He is a former member of the 500 Gallery, one of the oldest co-op galleries in Texas. His work has been featured in the 2013 Texas Biennial New American Paintings Magazine, issue 108 and issue 132. Impossible Geometries curated by the works of Laren Haynes at Field Projects in New York City and the 14by48.org's temporary billboard public art project. In addition, Valderas received the Moss Chimley Award and a micro grant from the National Sculpture Center in Dallas for his guerrilla site specific projects. In 2018, Valderas resigned from his reappointment to the City of Dallas Cultural Affairs Commission, having served under the Councilman Omar Narvaez to run for Dallas City Council to represent the neighborhood he grew up in. Valderas led a grassroots campaign where he placed a strong second. Next, we have Yolanda Alameda. Yolanda is a lifelong resident of Oak Cliff. She attended Peeler Elementary, Griner Middle School, and graduated from Addison High School. She has over 20 years of experience in arts management, community development, and program delivery. Yolanda served as director of the Museums and Cultural Affairs Department for the City of El Paso and as Assistant Director of the Office of Cultural Affairs for the City of Dallas. She now focuses her efforts on health promotion as a certified wellness coach and as a wellness resource consultant for Gruma Corporation and United Health Group. Yolanda holds a BA in Psychology and Criminal Justice from the University of North Texas and a Master's in Public Administration from Rutgers. A lifelong learner, she is currently working on a master's in social work and public health. She served as a District 6 Commissioner on the Arts and Cultural Advisory Commission for the City of Dallas, but resigned to go hyperlocal and focus on her immediate community. She volunteers with the Polk Vernon Neighborhood Association, the West Oak Cliff Coalition, and the Coalition for Neighborhood Self-Determination. Yolanda is very honored to be included among the many neighbors and colleagues working for neighborhood self-determination and disrupting the barriers to equity and inclusion of everyday people in the planning process that directly impact them. Yolanda was recently elected to serve as the Democratic Precinct Chair for her Area 4063 and looks forward to turning Texas blue in 22. In all her endeavors, she is committed to influencing individual and community transformation and to efforts to improve the human condition. And we are also joined by Juan Contreras. Juan Contreras is an operations analyst for Bank of America, who also co-chairs their employee resource group ERG in North Texas, Hispanic Latino Organization for Leadership and Advancement, OLA, which helps promote employee growth, engagement and fosters local partnerships with organizations in the region. After spending over a decade in civic engagement during his free time as a volunteer with the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, Juan knows the importance of being involved in his local community. In 2014, Juan co-funded the Texas Latino Pride, an annual gathering of celebration becoming a unique space of culture welcoming the LGBTQIA plus Hispanic Latinx communities, while also raising funds for local agencies. In addition to his community involvement, Juan has co-chaired the National Latinx Institute at Creating Change and continuously advocates for basic humane rights for members of the LGBTQIA plus and immigrant communities. Juan studied at El Centro College for Culinary Arts and applies his studies to help his family taquerias in the Dallas metro area. And so before we begin, uh, I just want to say I'm really excited even after uh, reading out loud the bios and I just want to thank every single one of our panelists to, tonight on behalf of the Dallas Mexican American Historical League for joining us in such an important conversation this evening. So let's go ahead and dive right in and I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen so the audience can go ahead and see every single one of us. To kick things off and just kind of level set the conversation before we get into the weeds of it all, let's share, help the audience know a little bit more about you, your history. How would you describe your roots? Well, All right, I'll drop. Uh, go ahead. I'll, um, 
Thanks. I'll, jo I'll jump in. I'm, um, I would say that um, my roots are actually uh, border culture. Uh, my mom is from South Texas and my dad was from the border of Mexico. And so, um, and I was raised with what I like to call a border ethic. Uh, that is that people that live on the border um, are resilient um, and, you know, community oriented. Um, just lots of really great, great characteristics that I take away from being raised by a mom from the border. So um, I'm Tejana, if anybody ever asks me uh, on a pan-Latino le level, I like to say that I'm Latina, um, just so I can um, kind of, you know, um, be in solidarity with, with the pan-Latino community. And, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm from Oak Cliff, so that's it. <laughs> I, I I will go next. Uh, my name is Giovanni Valderes. Uh, thank you, Jennifer and Damal, for hosting this. It's amazing. I think it's so important and also impactful that we show the contributions to the neighborhood and what we've accomplished. Uh, such a, a long history here. Uh, I am um, a son of a fierce Latina woman. She's from Central America, Guatemala, and a dad who's Mexican American, grew up here in Oak Cliff. And for me, I, you know, I'm also a visual artist and in addition to being a professor, but uh, I am extremely lucky and blessed that this community helped raise me in a sense. And I think that that's, that is what's so special about, about Oak Cliff. You know, we, our neighbors, our cousins, our aunts and uncles are you know, like we they, we take care of each other and and so I think without them you know I, I wouldn't be where I'm at and, and so and I think as a visual artist um, you know I I I cannot help but absorb the passion and also the conflicts of of what's happening in our neighborhoods and I try to reflect that in, in my art practice. So, yeah. And uh, I guess I'm next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Juan Contreras. Um, my roots, I would say uh, Mexican, um, but uh, Mexican Oak Cliffian, uh, born and raised in Oak Cliff um, and uh, raised around a lot of antojitos. Uh, I was just looking at my desk and I have like tacos <laughs> and I have taqui tajin. <laughs> so um, when my parents migrated here, um, uh, I guess a conversation to have though, but uh, although Mex uh, Mexican uh, parents, um, I always felt like my community was here in, in Oak Cliff um, since they were always uh, uh, working. So, um, but for the most part, um, yeah, I love Oak Cliff, so. Thank you all for sharing. I mean, I think, you know, it's a, there's a lot to say, right, when, asked what are your roots it's not just us it's our ancestors and the legacy they created and what we're continuing to doing right so thank you all for sharing so tonight's conversation as we all know it's centered on community involvement but just kind of want to take a step back before we dive in deeper because when you look at the definition of community it can mean a lot of things Community sometimes is used to refer a group of people within a certain area, so like a neighborhood, or community can also be used to refer a group of people with a common interest. Sometimes it could be as simple as music or uh, an issue, a campaign, etc. So, with that in mind, how would each of you describe your community? And you might have more than one. Uh, I, I will go. Uh, <laughs> hopefully others will jump in. You know, for me, my sense of community is, is also a sense of place. Um, it's also identifying what the different sets of responsibilities that our community, um, you know, endures. Uh, so for example, like I come from an immigrant family um, and I think we also have to recognize that there are certain um, obstacles that are placed um, in front of us that, that let's say I am now, you know, I'm an American citizen. So I don't 
I don't necessarily identify with that anymore, but I grew up in that, that kind of environment. So, so ex a really great example of what I'm talking about is like, you know, I, I would all, often hear kind of complaints of how like, let's say uh, our um, neighbors who've been here for a while would say, you know, I, I don't get it. You know, most Mexican American families, they don't want to get involved in the PTA. We try really hard, but I just don't think they recognize the responsibilities, the additional responsibilities that these families have. So most of them are working um, two jobs, uh, taking care of multiple family members because most of the time our households are intergenerational. So grandmothers, grandfathers that we're taking care of. And we also got to put our kids, you know, to uh, got to feed them and then put them to bed. So there's just a kind of multitude of things that are happening. And so I think for me, you know, this idea of community, it's, it's actually understanding that and then also being empathetic um, because be, because of my my experience and me growing up like that um i now have the privilege to kind of assimilate into like this american culture where i can have a decent paying job and and, and it's because they laid the, the framework down for me so I, I think it's it's also acknowledging that I think that was so eloquent that um, <laughs> just, you know, when I think about community, I think that was all really great points that Gio made. And I um, I just think is, you know, it's important is community is how you define it, right? So, or family is how you define it. And so I, um, I would just say, you know, I identify, obviously there's so much um, intersectionality as they say these days, but you know, I identify with uh, with the women's movement and women's issues. I identify with my BIPOC community. You know, I identify with my neighborhood. I identify with my family, and I think that I think that's what is um, most important to me is that it's how we define it and how we derive meaning from it, and then what we do with those with with those choices that we make or where we find ourselves. And to echo um, with my colleagues here, um, uh, I was just actually, um, I was thinking back to an article that was written by, um, by Medium uh, where they felt that community had a definition problem because traditionally uh, community would be based on set location and uh, shared values. Um, however, if you shift from a traditional phase and to where it's now, we get to choose our community, right? We get to choose our community, whether it be location-based here in Oak Cliff, whether it be, um, you know, my community with Texas Latino Pride, which is a group of 10 of us, uh, you get to choose it, who you want to be in your community. And like I chose my colleagues too, so. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I wanted to start with that be because it's so true what you all shared. Community looks differently to everyone and it feels differently. Um, but yet again, right, I just want to kind of let set the stage because uh, many times we all wear multiple hats within those different communities and take on different roles. Sometimes we're taking the lead or serving as a supporter to something. So thank you all for sharing um, what that means to you. And along those same lines, you know, your bios, I mean, without a doubt, each single one of you is very involved in the community in your different communities um, that you're a part of. Why? Why is that important to you to be involved? Um, I think as the, um, probably the senior of the panel, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, um, I'll take that one or I'll start with that. And I think one of the things that I've, um, I'm very conscious of over the years is that, um, and we may not all be conscious of it, but that nothing that we do is altruistic, right? Even in the, even in the um, taking action in the community, I must derive something from it, right? And so I'm always really aware of that. I always kind of check myself about what is my what is my takeaway but I really do want to say this might come from the fact that so my mom was not a somebody who was a volunteer 
actually when I told her like, you know, college and older ages that I was, uh, well, I went in the Peace Corps, right? And I was going to volunteer. And, you know, you can imagine a George Lopez moment, like, yeah, it is loco or it is loca, right? What are you going to volunteer for? Not make any money because it was not really our ethic, right? We're, we go to college to get a degree to have a better life. So the concept of volunteerism wasn't a part of her vocabulary necessarily. But she would always be the first one to say, let's make tamales and rice and beans and sell plates, right, for somebody's whatever. She was always the first one to say, let's let's pull our resources, right? So she might have not had volunteerism in her vocabulary, but this spirit of taking care of people was definitely a part of her, her vernacular. And I think that my participation in community is rooted in that. I have a really strong sense of obligation it really is obligation, right, to engage, to help people, and to be of service. And so I often think, well, what, you know, what do I derive from that? We can talk about that later, but I really do. It comes from a deep-rooted sense of service and obligation to my community and to people. Wow, I well said, Yolanda. Like, a, you know, and I don't think Yolanda gets enough credit. Um, she she started a whole movement in the early 2000s and, and 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 honestly like that's where i got my start that's where like for me i identified like i realized how important it was for community uh, involvement and and it was because of the ice house cultural center something yolanda started um something that needed to be started in oak cliff because you know she had the vision to to realize that there needed to be an outlet for young um young people in Oak Cliff to go to, to express, to, to learn different art forms. And, and I was one of those kids who just showed up. I was looking for a, a purpose. And I think the most brilliant thing, um, it comes back to the ABC development thing, right? Like it, it, is, it is recognizing someone's potential, but also giving them value. And, and what the Ice House Cultural Center did was hire me because I was a volunteer and that meant the world to me because I saw that they, they acknowledged that I had some kind of talent. And, and so that set the trajectory for me and, and to become an artist because I was around a bunch of artists and I saw like the impact that we're making. And it, I think the lasting legacy of the Ice House is the murals that, that were accomplished by like Simi and, 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 and how Yolanda like helped that, right? And, and along with other individuals as well, but in organizations, but the beautiful thing is like those murals, not only at the Ice House, but also in the Bishop Arts District, those are still there today. And those were painted by kids from the neighborhood. And that's special. Every time I go by those murals, I think about those kids. And, you know, these are, you know, individuals normally who would be written off as like, oh, they're just these punk kids. But I was one of those punk kids, right? So, yeah. And still is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the one, um, me, myself, uh, I, I love humor. Um, even during uh, my down, uh, toughest times, I, I turn to humor to to help me cope with, with things. Um, and if I can bring humor to other people and make them laugh, then so be it. Um, but uh, I guess to, to jump on what Yolanda and Giovanni uh, stated, mine was more, um, uh, shared experience based. Um, I was still uh, very young, uh, introduced to the, to the uh, LULAC Learning Center um, on Ed over here on Edgefield by Griner. Um, and I, I got to meet uh, a group of kids who were looking for a sponsor. Um, I've never done any type of volunteerism like that ever uh a friend of mine asked me hey these high school kids are looking for a sponsor so they can continue their council uh or you know charter um and i and i went ahead and uh let's do it um and then i'll just learn um as i you know uh watch them do the, you know roberts that's where i learned roberts rules and everything so it was nice i was learning um although they should have probably learned from me. I was learning from them, so um, definitely I would say uh, if I, if uh, people always ask me how did you get involved, 
it all started with a group of kids. So. And, and I think that just goes to show, it's like, you give us an opportunity and, and we'll take advantage of it, just like anyone else. I mean, and that's it. The thing I love about Oak Cliff, we come from a hustle mentality. We are from the tamale lady who used to sell tamales at Mountain View College when I used to work there, rolling around her ice chest around the campus. It's just like we hustle and it, you give us that opportunity, we will take advantage of it and flourish. And they'll add to, we'll do it together, right? It'll be the mom, the dad, the brother, the sisters, and just or you just helping your mom. I mean, it's it's something that we see in Oak Cliff. It, you know, it's not just the you know the businesses with a certain address. We're mm -hmm. mobile. We move around a lot. You know, like we're going to be everywhere because we're you know trying to help our family, help our community. Like Joanna just shared, right? So it's sometimes it, a family would help another family get through a hard time, right? So there's a lot of unity and synergy. So. We are going to add something. I saw y'all unmuted, Gio and Yolanda. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, awesome. All right, now that we kind of got covered, you know, the baseline on um, community involvement, as we all know, things don't always go as planned when we're trying to get the work done. And so can each of you share some specific ways that you've advocated for change? And it could be just one example. But in your example, what have been the success piece of that advocacy you were pushing for, but also what were the challenges and hurdles that you also faced at the same time? I think for me, it uh, was more of um, uh, in the sense of participation and collaboration. Um, I think that was my, my biggest hurdles. Um, I guess when, when you go into that world, um, I, I'd say it's a world, right? It's a community involvement filled with advocates, activists, uh, in whatever capacity they can. Um, sometimes, uh, even within that space, it's not very welcoming, um, I would say. Um, at least that's that was some of my experiences. Um, however, you will meet along the way um, some very inspiring individuals and caring individuals that no matter uh, what title they hold or how long they be doing, they've been doing this, uh, they, will open, uh, they will open their hearts and also their minds to teach you uh, to better yourself. And if it's something that you're wanting to go into, it's a lovely space. Uh, it's a labor of love. As, uh, for most uh so uh but those i would say those were the hurdles that I, I was to identify i would say it was those for the most part yeah i can um i can add to that i, I think uh, juan is on point i think um like in my um professional and volunteer career there's um always been sort of that guidepost like you know Gia was sharing our experience at the ice house and maybe that was my role but there were people in my life in my career that made that possible right so the person um who told me it was okay so that I could tell somebody it's okay and although I don't work in city government or I don't do you know don't have aspirations for public service I think having people in those positions are so important and um, for us to support them, good, bad, or indifferent, like we may not always agree with everything that they that those folks are doing, but we have to recognize, I think what I've recognized is that those are hard positions to be in and we have to, to support those folks so that they create space for us. So I was gonna say, I think, you know, some of the, the successes of the times that Gia referred to was that I worked in city government and I was in a position to impact change, right? I had access to funding. I had access to programming and, um, and that helped being in that position was a, was a help. I think, you know, I have to say, obviously the, the challenge was changing perceptions. Um, and when I go back to supporting folks, it's, you know, some hard, it's like, it's, it's really challenging, right, to be the one that's trying to um, to propose a different way, right? And we can, we have 
Um, and so, I, you know, I just think that um, the challenge is perception. And I think the one one great thing that has changed is that we're not willing to put up with bullshit anymore, just to be quite honest, is that we all have to call it when we see it, right? And I so admire that, especially you guys, you know, the younger generations that really have a level of self-confidence and awareness that we have to call it out when we see it. So I think that was a challenge for me personally as a young professional coming up was, you know, coming from a more conservative background and not wanting to be the one that rocked the boat. And so, I mean, I think we got to rock the boat, right? <laughs> you got to rock the boat. You have to change perceptions. And if you can't change perceptions, you just have to keep, you, have, you know, you don't, you, we create our own, our own infrastructure, our own paradigms. Well said, Yoli, well said. Um, I think for me, uh, beautiful moments were during the campaign when I ran for city council, it was from like white progressives um, to marginalized people who felt like they had a voice and they couldn't contribute. And, and so for me, it was knocking on doors and, and it's a challenge. And, and I think that's some of the heartbreaking moments when, when I would get off of work and get my my walking list and go to the neighborhood and it's like man because it's a lot because you are absorbing all the frustrations and anger that a community has been left behind and and so here you go this fresh face and they're like well, who the fuck are you like what are you gonna do for me if the rich white guy ain't doing nothing for me how are you gonna do something for me and, and so is but it was it started having those conversations at the door. Um, and, and I think one, one of the most, I think, beautiful moments where I walked up and it was like a rough neighborhood and, and there was a group of, you know, you know let's, let's like, we'll, we'll, we'll speak some honesty on this. They, 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 they were a little like, you know, a little rough. And, and I thought to myself, I could either walk past them and ignore them because that would be the safest thing to do or I could go up to them and talk to them. And so I decided on the ladder and, 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 and I, the first thing I said was like, Hey, what's up guys. Uh, you know, I introduced myself, told them what I was doing. It's like, are y'all planning on voting? And they were like, do we look like we vote? <laughs> I was like, all right. Yeah. I stand corrected, but this is why I'm doing it. But we had a conversation and that conversation was genuine. And at the end, they thanked me for coming. And these were just, you know, a couple of dudes. Uh, I mean, like a, probably like four or five of them. And, and so and that's what we need in this community. We need to be talking to our neighbors, no matter how intimidating it may be. But for me, I mean, that was, that, that was the definition of change. If we can walk into these neighborhoods that have been ignored, um, we, can, we can start to build that trust again. And the quick plug-in for those watching, um, any questions you might have, because I, I personally have a lot of questions, but I want to allow, you know, those watching to come in. So I've been writing down those <laughs> and follow-up questions to what you all are sharing. So just want to do that quick plug-in. Um, and so y'all have kind of touched on this already, but still want to pose the question. Um, when you're, you know, on the ground doing this work, y'all, you know, it said that, I'm giving, but I'm also receiving because of my actions. And so what are some valuable lessons that come to your mind um, as you've you know, been helping others in the community and how has that impacted you? I think I um, kind of goes back to something Juan said about, you know, there's always gonna be somebody there to help you. I think what I've learned over all these years is that we we sometimes or when you're I don't know I went into it right the 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 show but the army of one right I can take care of everything I can fix everything but really obviously that's not true and and so I think what my takeaway over the years has been that there's strength in the collective right and that um that you have to trust in the collective so I, you know, I bring, even at, at this stage of the game, I bring a certain skill set and a, a certain knowledge and a certain passion. And what I bring to the table is different from what Juan brings to the table. 
and it's different from what Giovanni brings to the table and even, you know, Jennifer, but then when we sit down and we are able to sort of part and parcel out the work, because it's a big, right, there's lots of, um, there's lots of ways to address or um, um, attack an issue, right? There's policy, there's community, there's, so I, I over the years is that it's really great to be, when you talk about community, to found a community, a collective of people that are passionate about the same types of issues, but we really take it from a totally different angle. And if you just let go and let people, and don't try to control it, and you just let people, uh, you know, we all work at where we're um, best, um, that we actually make a lot more success. And I think the only other thing I'd tell you that I've learned over the years is that you have to nurture yourself as much as you're willing to nurture other people. And then there's still working silence. on that, Yolanda. <laughs> <laughs> I was still working on that. Um, you know, that end piece, it's uh, um, learning to let go of things and not trying to control. Um, but I guess my struggle is um, allowing people to do when they can, moving at their pace and not my pace, right? My pace is like right there and then if, and then I get stressed because I'm like, oh, you can, I can do it. I can do it for you. But then I'm also thinking if I do it from, if I do it for them, how are they going to feel, you know? Um, but I would say uh, I, I, I'm working on that. Um, I admit it, working on it, identifying people's strengths and, and letting them be creative. Uh, uh, but I would say I've met a lot of people, especially, um, with Texas Latino Pride, who, you know, we're all volunteer based. We, we don't get paid. Um, and a lot of the work takes a lot of time, you know, on top of most of the, uh, our, our volunteers work from nine to five. From nine to five, they most of them have to commute an hour back to their homes and then they have to work on this production. Um, so I'm really grateful for all of my volunteers um, and all the effort they put into it. Uh, whether uh, whether small or big, I, I think everyone has something to contribute. So, yeah, I, I think uh, what Yolanda and Juan um, said is just it's so true. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes you know our community does so much that that we forget that we have a bandwidth and we think we can just keep doing and doing. Um, but I think it's because, at least for me, there is something to prove. And, and I think we find ourselves doing that all the time. Like we are, we are always trying to validate ourselves. And, and, and so, but on the flip side of that, it's also important, right? Because our community, at least for me growing up, always being told how we are, we are a detriment to this community. Oh man, Oak Cliff was so great until those Mexicans came, you know, like, and, and that's a narrative, that's a real narrative, right? But just like A.K. A. Sandoval Strauss puts in his book in Body of America, it's just like, no, wait a minute. <laughs> we, we created businesses, we bought homes, we put our kids in school in fa fa um, uh, failing school systems. We did all that without city subsidies. And, and I think, that's a moment of empowerment. Like, you know what? We did that without the city's help. And, and that, for me, I think that's the most bothersome, bothersome thing that happens. Like this city chooses its winners and its losers. They put the thumb on the scale. And so, and my thing has always been, even when I was on the Cultural Affairs Commission, if you're gonna give a rich organization a lot of money, you better damn well do it into these, these working class neighborhoods because they deserve it just as much as they do. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and so I have these two questions that come at opposite ends, just in case, you know, someone watching who might fall on either spectrum. But the first question uh, would be, what advice would you give to someone who has that energy, that ganas to give back to their community? 
but they are nervous, they don't know how, or they don't even know where to start. What would you tell someone? And go, go tell them to talk to Juan and, and Yolanda, they put them to work. <laughs> they find That's right. That's right. Nurture, nurture that ganas, because uh, those ganas don't last forever. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, no, I, but, would... uh, I mean, um, yeah, I would, my advice would be um, go for it, do it. Uh, meet someone in the community. You can even talk to myself. Um, if, if you, if there's some interest there, um, come on, uh, any, at any capacity. Uh, I think like one of the struggles for me was um, uh, that imposter, what they call it, imposter syndrome, when you're like, when you're out there doing things, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, why? Like, I don't feel like I deserve, or you know, I'm doing this, you know. Um, and because along the way, like I mentioned earlier, you, you will meet individuals, especially like they call it uh, old guard, right? Um, they don't not want to let go. Um, of what they built and it may have started it may have started as uh something genuine and as time goes by uh unfortunately sometimes that that um shifts to some some other type of um value or, or moral value not sure uh but if if they feel threatened um, they will do anything in their power to kind of shift you away from, from that. So, so yeah, so just, oh. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. There's always somebody, I mean, there could be always somebody, right, that wants to wish you ill. I'm going to borrow a line from Paolo Coelho that the universe is conspiring in your favor just to take the other perspective is that I think that when you want to do something and the intent or whatever the you know the desire of your heart is good I think that the universe makes a way for you to make those things I know that sounds you know kind of like um high in the sky but I really do believe that and um but I I would say um to one thing I I would say there's a book it's called small is beautiful it's an ancient old economics book but the the idea is to start small so, you know, um, I started big, like I had to get these like, you know, city jobs or these positions or these accolades. And, but I don't think that that's where the, the, the real work happens, you know, six degrees of separation. So to work on a small scale is beautiful. Um, it's the unsung, the work of the unsung hero, but that's where the work happens. That's where change happens. Um, and that too, uh, something that Giovanni alluded to is this ABC approach, this asset-based approach to community development, which I learned a long time ago when I was in the Peace Corps and in graduate school. But, but the idea um, resonates. And now that I'm working on a social work degree, it's the same. It's about, you know, we look at people as, or, or some schools, we look at folks as problematic, right? Things that need to be fixed, something that needs to be solved. And really that's, you know, if we changed, if we flipped the paradigm and looked at folks um, and what they have to offer, what are the strengths of your community? What are the assets that you hold? And how can you galvanize that to help and help people empower and engage to make their own change? So that's been really important to me over the years is that what I've learned is that you can't you know, you can't, um, we have a variety of community members. Some people don't want to know. They're on a need to know basis. No matter how many times you knock on their door, they're not going to come out to vote or they're not going to come to the meeting. But to me, it's important for them to know, right? To at least have the information so that then they can make a choice. And so, um, because you do impact change and people do um, choose to get involved sometimes or choose to be aware. So, I think both to the, on both sides of your question, right? Um, um, if that was your question, somebody that maybe is like feeling like, oh, why, do, what is it, you know, why am I going to do this again? Oh, this is like, you know, it's this idea that, um, that uh, on that respect, it's a community development is a cumulative process and the benefits accrue over time. 
So, you know, you might be in a community for a month or three months or six months or a year or five years or 10 years and never think, you know, especially in the beginning, you think you're not seeing it, you're not seeing or you're not deriving, right, the, the, the benefits and the payoff that you think um, is supposed to happen. But it's because it takes time. You know, if we think about how many generations, right, how many generations has it taken us to be where we are? And so it's going to take, it takes time. And so when you feel like giving up, it's just that opportunity, you know, you might take a break or you might, you know, pass it off to Juan or Giovanni and say, hey, look, I'm going to get a shot of tequila. I can't do this today. <laughs> you can take a break and come back. You know what I mean? So it is it, a cumulative process where the benefits accrue over time. And some of us may never live to see the fruits of our labor, but that doesn't mean we don't do it. Mm, well said, well said. Uh... Yeah, my only piece of advice is that that recognize that we hold power and it's our choice to use it. And and the, the great thing is this the fear and frustrations that we all carry, we have an opportunity to do something with it instead of letting it fester and create resentment. And the magical thing is, if you're feeling that in the community, I guarantee you there's a bunch of other people feeling that. So if you can harness all that energy we have some real power and we can flex it. I like that quote. We have some power, we can flex it. Cause when you think of flex, you think of muscle. <laughs> and it's like, no, we're talking about different flex, like inside. <laughs> um, and, you know, another thing too that um, I wanted to ask is just in case we are, have folks, T slogan here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna, don't copyright that deal. <laughs> um, so the other question I have, because it happens to me too, it's hard to say no <laughs> to people, to, you know, things that need your urgent uh, attention. If you are, how do you get those moments of break? We heard, we heard some examples of like, oh, just a margarita, tequila shot. <laughs> but how does that kind of look like when you're like, okay, I am burned out. What does recharging look like to you? The burnout, um, that is very, it does exist. Um, and, it's, and it's when you have all the ganas and, and you don't, and, and you don't uh, control it. And um, in between those ganas, there's time for self-care for you uh, as well for others. Um, and I'm sure Yolanda will speak a lot about that. Um, but uh, it, it was hard for me to learn how to take self-care um, until I burned out. I burned out and I just stopped everything I was doing. Didn't wanna hear any, didn't wanna take part in any conversation, part in any activities nothing, um, just completely burnt out for two years. Um, and it's normal. Um, and it happens with a lot of people, especially a lot of people that start uh, with a lot of ganas and, and they just don't know how to control it. And they last about a few years and then you, they kind of fall off and, and you don't hear from them um, again. So, but those are the most uh, inspiring people and, and people that are willing to do the, the work, so. Yeah, I, I think that that is definitely real. Um, I, I, I face it all the time, but it, it's about, and I always think like, if I don't have enough to give, it, th that is time to kind of step back because I, I'm, a, I'm no benefit to anyone if I'm just trying to you know, do all things at, all at once. But, but I think on the flip side of that, I think it's important for everyone else who's recognizing someone who's burning out is to you know, empathize with that that person and, and also be there like hey you know what let's go do something that's non-related to what we're doing and, and and so it's being you know that support system that that's needed um and i feel like that's really important because in our at least in our culture you know this culture of like hyper mask masculinity like we're not allowed to like you know be you know cower down or whatever but you know, it, it's important for us to reset. And for me, it's personally, it's 
is going to other cities and looking at art and just stepping away from everything. It's always been my recharge. I think that was a good point about, um, oh yeah, I already forgot it. That's my senior citizen status. Um, oh, just what you said about, you know, having um, empathy, right, for others and empathy for yourself um, is, is really important. And I think one of the things, again, I've learned over the years is that I think we have to trust that if you step away from the work, it's not going to die. I mean, the work doesn't stop just because you step away, because you've got Juan, you've got Gio, you've got Rio Plani, you've Somos Tejas. Um, I think that you know we we have to trust that the work is going to go on. And if it's not, if we're not able to, uh, like Gio said, right? If we don't have anything left to give, then it's time to take a step back. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Gio says he lives in a hyper masculine right culture from a maybe from a, a you know perspective of culture, but I think the flip to the side to that, at least like I grew up with a single mom, like I try to be aware of not falling into the martyr syndrome. You know, I don't like it's, I don't have to do it all, you know, like if I don't do it, it's not gonna get done. The truth is it's not gonna get done the way I wanted to get done, <laughs> but it's gonna get done, right? And so I just think that, you know, we don't want to fall into some of those negative stereotypes of maybe our antepasados, right? That we had to endure, we have to suffer in silence. Um, we don't live in that culture anymore. And it wasn't, it's not help, it wasn't helpful to them and it's not helpful to us. So I, I think Gio is right in that not only do we need to reach out to others, but we need to be willing to say, hey, you know what? I'm just having a moment. I'm, you know, I'm this, I'm this much crazy and I let you know it and I'm going to, you know, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I, I'm glad that we live in, a, I, I hope that we live in a kinder time in that respect. Yeah, so Juan, call me, check up on me. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, and thank you to Victoria Fred Ortiz. That was uh, her question and it was already being alluded, it was kind of brewing up in our conversation. So, you know, it was important to talk about it because, yeah, when you have to give a lot, then you run out of energy and you have nothing else to give. And, you know, you might end up doing, you know, saying something or reacting in a way, not from a bad place, but because, you know, you're dealing with something inside that's going unaddressed. So, yeah, that's really important of being, because you are pointing it, pointed it throughout the entire conversation is that the work we're doing, we might not even see the fruits of it, right? And for reality is our ancestors, they didn't see it, but it's like that snowball effect that we just kind of see the things moving the needle in the right direction. And so, you know, it's just kind of being okay with taking a step back, taking time off of work and things of that nature. Um, and we have a little bit, like six minutes left, um, but I just wanted to hone in on, oh, here we go, someone has a question. So some, uh, Violeta Gallardo asked, how do you balance the community and activism with your daily, you know, job, like your professional job? So from the nine to five that Juan, you know, talked about, how do y'all balance that? Sometimes I get to do it while I'm working. If I'm doing my, um, if I'm wearing my ERG hat, um, I get to partner with amazing organizations that we know here locally, um, you know, such as you guys and uh, other organizations that, that we get to help out. Um, so I love that part uh, when it's, you know, when I'm with my nine, within my nine to five hours. After that, if I do have the energy. Um, I'd say, uh, especially right now, because I'm, I'm on my uh, crunch time, um, it's usually as soon as I get home, open up my laptop and see what else I have to do uh, for, you know, whatever project I'm working on. So, mm. I mean, for me, it's always about scheduling. But the unfortunate thing is, just like working class people don't have that luxury of balancing things out. Because when I was running for office, it was after I got off of work, it was knocking on doors. And, and yeah, it's a lot of work. And, and you know, and there's, and, and we see that in the political process, at least we see why there's always rich people running for office, because they have the time and they have the money, and they have the network. And, 
just the hurdles that you have to do to even set up an account to run for office takes a whole day, if not two days. Um, and so a normal person can't take off of work to do that. And so, yeah, there, there is those hurdles, but I think when you have that small like achievement or win, it makes it so much sweeter. And, and, and but all our lives, is, it's always been like that. We've always had to work harder than everyone else. So it's no different. And I wish there was a better answer, but at least for me, that, that's where I'm at. Um, I think I would only add, and again, uh, it's at phases in life, right? I think um, I remember being like, a, you know, a mom of young children, a wife, a professional, and it's hard. It really is hard. Um, you make choices. Um, um, so I think, but I think what I've been able to do over the course of my experience is that a lot of times what I do aligns. My profession aligns with my personal um, goals and as much as, and that's worked for me is like, I, so I work as a wellness consultant to work from home. The work I do is about serving people related to health. The work I do in the community is about serving other people, serving folks through on a diff bunch of different platforms. So this may or may not make sense, but when I look at the work that I do, I look at it all as the same work. And somebody might say that's rationalization. But <laughs> so if I, you know, if I get a break in the middle of my day and I and I do something related to the community. I do it. And then I, you know, I manage my time and I manage my projects. Um, and I really, in my mind, justify it as being part of the bigger picture in terms of the work that I do. Um, and that has helped me, especially in the last few years, to be able to manage, manage the different pots. Uh, and even, you know, in the community, it's really wonderful. There might be a handful of organizations that I'm working with, but at the end of the day, like I said, I went hyper local. They're all Oak Cliff. They're all community focused. Um, they're all about reaching people. And so when I'm doing for one group, I'm actually doing for all four groups. And so that has really helped me sort of manage my, it, it's actually not necessarily manage my time because my time is still a, a mess sometimes, but it's a mind, it's a mindset. I've been able to manage how my mind organizes the work I do. And that helps me to to get to be able to get it all done, or contribute it contribute to the process. That's a great question, though, Violetta. And I know people are at different stages in life, and I think it just kind of goes back to you give what you can, what makes sense for you at the moment. You know. Thank you all. It I I'm taking this to heart because <laughs> I could also benefit from y'all's answers. Um, and, you know, we're already at the almost seven minute mark, a few seconds away, just to wrap up, um, are there any groups or organizations that you would like to share to those watching this now or later? I took myself off of mute really quick to jump in. Now I want to go first. <laughs> the West Oak Cliff Coalition, the Coalition for Self-Determination. Dallas Mexican American His, uh, Historic League, Rio Planning, Somos Tejas. But my, my most personal and immediate plug would be for the Friends of the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. So a thousand years ago, we started something called the Ice House, which led to the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. After 10 years, they we now have a nonprofit to support the growth and development of the Oak Cliff Cultural Center. And so that would be my plug. And I would really encourage everybody to to contribute to the growth of that organization. And uh, for me, um, TexasLatinoPride.org, uh, we have a couple of events uh, to piggyback on Yolanda. Uh, we're having an event this Friday at the Oak Cliff Cultural Center, which is a queer art night uh, from seven to 10. So come on out, it's free. Uh, and then Saturday at Riversham Park, we have our uh, large music festival uh, with a celebrity, very nostalgic, I don't know, uh, depending on, you know, where you're at as far as age, but Lorena Herrera is going to be there uh, and we'll be there from three to nine and it's free general admission. I, I think these two just summed up uh, really great organizations to go volunteer and, and give money to. 
so uh, th thank you all. Oh. Still waiting for that money, <laughs> Giovanni. When I get my first paycheck. All right, we talked about this offline. Now you want you want to try to bring that up now? <laughs> um, well, thank. Thank you to each single one of you. I, I personally had a lot of fun and we ran out of time because I had more follow-up questions for you all, but that's okay because I know how to reach you. And I hope that those, you know, this is your first time meeting them. A great group of people done so much work in Dallas community. And like as they just said, you know, it, it takes all of us collectively to influence the change, but it's also important to know when you need to recharge as well. Um, and so, again, I just want to thank every single one of you on behalf of the Dallas Mexican American Historical League for sharing your insight, your advice, because I know y'all are busy, but y'all made time to be here. Um, so I just quickly will share my screen to close out tonight. One second. Okay, I think, there we go. All right. So for more information about the Dallas Mexican American Historical League and the work we are doing, feel free to check out our social media handles at the mall official and join the organization as well. You can become a member and remember that we have other events going on as part of the Nuestro Oak Cliff exhibit and we'll be hosting this same conversation on Thursday completely in Spanish and so you know feel free to join again as well. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you so much everyone for your time as well for you know joining us virtually in this space. And we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>